force of rock and timber. In a little more than six months, it will be transformed into a high-tech city, populated by an army of highly skilled men and women that will eventually total 20,000. Commissioned by the Boeing Aircraft Company, their mission is simply to build the biggest and fastest subsonic commercial jetliner ever constructed. It would carry over 350 passengers at over 600 miles an hour. Its name was 747. The 747 really was a quantum leap in capacity and capabilities that if you were planning the growth of an industry in a logical progressive way, you probably wouldn't do that. You probably wouldn't you probably wouldn't grow an airplane hundred and fifty percent larger than the one that came before. Boeing President Bill Allen assigned Vice President Mel Stamper to head the 747 project. Allen said, how would you like to build the biggest airplane in the world? And so Stamper, he, he leaped to it, you know, and, and uh, moved his head up there. The 747 project demanded the design and construction of 270,000 tools. But the first tools that went to work in the original jumbo jet were not welding rigs or rivet guns. They were chainsaws and bulldozers. So big was the project that no building existed that could house it. One would have to be built. 780 acres of forest were cleared 45 miles north of Seattle, next to an abandoned World War II airfield. A two-mile spur of railroad track had to be added to the main rail to move building materials up to the plant site. 34,000 tons of steel arrived by rail for the initial construction of the 200 million cubic foot structure. It will become the biggest building in the world. Later, the same track will be used to bring in the gigantic sub-assemblies, 20,000 contractors in all 50 United States countries around the world. The total assembly will require over 4 million individually numbered and cataloged parts. The project would take 5 years, 5 million dollars. It would consume 10 million engineering man hours and 14,000 hours of moon tunnel testing. The first design is dated from 1965, when American Airlines President Ron Tripp bankrolled the project with a quarter billion dollar down payment for 25 of the monster planes. By the spring of 1967, the giant sub-assemblies began to arrive while plant construction was still underway. Boeing employees called it the Aluminum Avalanche. Stamper's rugged 747 was also given a nickname. Stamper called them the Incredibles. They wore Paul Bunyan stickers on their hard hats and their lunch pails, and they wouldn't go home at the end of the shift. Working around the clock, the Incredibles struggled to meet the 1969 deadline, when the first 747 was due to roll off the line. Well, it had to come down to a certain point on the factory floor, and the first center section was out, and then all the parts become the line floor. That flow began with a mass of wings. After being assembled in huge fixtures called jigs, they were joined to the enormous center section made of titanium. Each wing with its 37 degrees of sweep measured 120 feet in length, 26 feet in width, and was 7 feet thick at its root. 52,000 rivets went into the assembly of each wing. The overwing section of the fuselage was then fitted to complete the center section. The root lifting of the plant was performed by 26 overhead cranes that traveled on 39 miles of network track. The combined lifting capacity was 1.9 million pounds. Next, the nose and forward body sections were lifted into place and joined to the center section. The 747's 
1,500 pounds of titanium alone yielded a weight savings of over a ton. The diet worked, and the project continued. The final step was the installation of the Pratt & Whitney JT9D3 engines, each capable of producing 43,500 pounds of thrust. Once all components were installed, they were tested and retested. The fuselage was pressurized, and all pressure seals were tested again. Once the testing phase was completed, the giant bird was towed to the paint hanger, where 300 gallons of paint added another 1,200 pounds to its maximum empty weight. Finally, the customer's insignia, or livery, were added to the plane's exterior. In 1969, all the questions had been answered except one. Would it fly? At 11.34 on February 9, 1969, that question was answered with an unqualified yes. After the usual debugging process in hiring to any new plane, the 747 went into commercial service on January 22, 1970. Since the first prototype rolled out in 1969, more than 1,300 747s have been produced. Three decades later, the 747 is still the biggest and fastest subsonic jet in the air. Since its entry into commercial service in 1970, approximately 1.6 billion passengers have flown in the 747. The 747 fleet has logged 20 billion miles, the equivalent of 42,000 trips to the moon and back. Next, the pioneers of jet power, the engineer and the test pilot. The first manned flight by Orville Wright in 1903 covered a distance of 120 feet. This equals the length of one 747 wing. Commercial jets will return on modern marvels. The Wright brothers' first manned flight in December of 1903 ushered in the era of powering fixed-wing aircraft with internal combustion piston engines. For almost two decades, aircraft engine builders accepted the conventional wisdom that any increase in power would come from more efficient piston engines. But by the 40s, every advance in power brought unwanted increases in weight, fuel storage, and maintenance. During the war, and by 1942 and 1943, piston engines are just about reached their maximum size. The United States was developing uh, 3,500 horsepower piston engines. Then they became so complex that they were becoming extremely heavy. And the need of an additional horsepower was was one of the extreme. We know the spinning propeller is in fact an airflow. The spinning rod is approaching the speed of sound a lot sooner than the wind will. When that happens, you get lots of vibration, you get high drag, and basically there's a speed limit in that. Taking the propeller out of the equation means that you're basically taking the cap off of the speed, at least as far as engine dynamics are concerned. During this time in England and in Germany, two men had been working independently on a technology that would revolutionize air travel. The German was a young engineer named Hans von Ohlen. The Englishman was RAF officer Frank Wing. The technology was aircraft jet propulsion. The concept of jet propulsion was nothing new. The challenge lay in using it to power airplanes. The most common form of jet engine today is the turbine jet. It uses spinning compressor wheels at the front end of the engine to compress the incoming air. The air is then mixed with fuel and ignited, and the blast of exhaust gases out the back propels the engine forward, as well as rotating turbine wheels at the back, which turn the compression wheels on the shaft. Whittle struggled for years to get the British government to take his jet engine concept seriously. Frank Whittle is a wonderful man. He was uh, irascible and awful and uh, somewhat short tempered. He had come up with the idea of the jet era in the early 1930s. And he wanted more advice. He wouldn't uh, be in a way not really cute, but really not getting the attention that it should have been. Meanwhile, Van Ohan's work drew the immediate interest and support of a leading German aircraft builder, Ernst Heigl. In 1936, Heinkel financed von Ohain's development of a jet engine prototype. By 1939, 
1939, when O'Hane's engine was being married to a swept-wing fighter airframe. In August of that year, just one month before the Nazi invasion of Poland, the HE-178 became the first jet-powered aircraft to fly. In England, Whittle's work was finally getting serious backing from the government. This new focus was brought to the attention of a visiting American Air Force general. In March of 1941, General Henry Hap Arnold was on a fact-finding visit to England. America was not yet in the war, but the U.S. was looking for ways it might help the British. Upon seeing Whittle's engine, Arnold saw an opportunity to help England and get his country into the jet age with one giant leap. He immediately made arrangements with the British government to have Whittle's W-1 engine and research shipped to General Electric Corporation at Lynn, Massachusetts. His purpose was to allow U.S. aircraft builders to study it as part of the war effort. Boeing and several other airframe makers were invited to study the W-1 and submit plans to incorporate the new engine into a viable high-speed, long-range military aircraft. Six years and many design hours later, Boeing parlayed this knowledge into the B-47 bomber. The B-47 was probably the most important little bit in our history for a full B-47. Came in the Naval 707, the KC-135, and the B-52, and all the modern designs. Weidel's engine design was not the only technology that made the B-47 such a revolutionary aircraft. Boeing's access to German swept wing technology, captured in the final years of the war, was the second part of the coup. Boeing's wind tunnel was the third. Boeing had started with the B-47, as I mentioned before. It was a 13-year-old project, and it was probably the best 13-year-old that was in every year missing. But the B-47 made a very good reason. After thousands of wind tunnel tests, Boeing learned that as a straight wing approaches supersonic speed, a layer of air builds up along its leading edge, increasing drag. The leading edge of an angled or swept wing is able to slice through the air at high speed, delaying the buildup of this unwanted layer. The U.S. had beaten England to the punch in the production of large military jets. In the years after the war, the British were determined to be the first in the air with a jet-powered commercial aircraft. At the time, America's Douglas Aircraft Company ruled the commercial skies with a piston-powered DC-3s, which carried 90% of the world's air traffic. The Americans seemed content to continue making jets for military use only. In 1949, Britain's de Havilland Aircraft Company stunned the aviation world with the unveiling of a sleek 93-foot-long jetliner prototype with 20 degree swept wings and two Whittle-designed jet engines buried in each wing work. It was christened the de Havilland Comet. It could carry 36 passengers and a crew of six at a cruising speed of almost 500 miles an hour, 50% faster than the fastest piston engine plane. Three years later, in 1952, the first Comet entered commercial service. But within two years, two Comets had crashed. After exhaustive investigations, it was determined the Comets crashed because of explosive decompression. The Comet had square windows, which sounds innocuous enough when you think about it, except that a square is a point at which a fatigue failure can start uh, more easily than a round window. And in fact, that's what happened with comets. Uh, very, very tiny cracks occurred at the, uh, in the corner of the windows. And once they occurred, it was just like ripping open a, a gigantic bag. It didn't roll apart because the inside differential pressure was so great. Five years it would take to recover. Britain's lead would be taken by the Americans and never regained. Next, the Americans built the first truly successful jetliner. At any given moment, there are approximately 40,000 commercial jet passengers in the skies over North America. Commercial jets will return on modern marvels. The post-war prosperity of the 1950s brought increases in personal income. Consumers were able to afford the things they wanted, and one of the things they wanted was travel. In 1951, Boeing President William Allen traveled to England with his top engineers to witness one of the first test flights of the Comet. He was impressed with the basic concept, but felt the scale of the plane was all wrong. So 
so the lawyer decided that they saw the truth and decided that they better get into business. The big consensus of the world is to raise their president to uh, one hour that they can run the airplane, but they run better than the common. Alan knew the Jets were the future. Still, he was reluctant. All previous Boeing commercial transports had been unsuccessful. It was more than 377, it was more than 247, there were several other noises. Douglas, on the other hand, was in the transport noise. The airlines were in there, and they had a wonderful relationship with the airlines, and they did the thrills, 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 and they did the thrills. In Boeing's favor was the experience it gained of producing the jet bombers B-47 and B-52. But Alan knew his company couldn't survive by military contracts alone. On April 22, 1952, Alan rolled the dice and sank $15 million, a quarter of the corporation's net assets, into the development of a new jet transport. It began life as the 386-80, but would eventually be renamed 707. Failure would mean bankruptcy. Success could mean riches and a giant lead in a new market. Learning from mistakes made by the Avalon, Boeing knew that the fuselage would have to be able to withstand thousands of cycles of pressurization. When Boeing did, they built a big tank, water tank, 100 feet long, 20 feet wide, 20 feet deep, and they built an entire fuselage. And they put this fuselage in the tank, and they pumped water in and out over a period to simulate cycles of flight. So based on that information, Airplanes. That's where it all started. Going back to what they learned on their large bomber projects, Boeing engineers designed the airliner with swept back wings angled at 35 degrees. Instead of placing the wings at the top of the fuselage, they created a low wing design. The 707 was designed to carry 130 passengers, more than three times as many as the Comets 36. Its four turbojet engines were pod mounted out of the wings rather than buried next to the fuselage. This design would prevent an engine fire from spreading into the cabin. The cruising speed was 535 miles per hour. The airframe was subjected to 4,240 hours of wind tunnel testing. The fuselage was reinforced with titanium tear stoppers to guard against stress cracks. In other words, uh, if you get a crack, you want to run and become catastrophic. You want it to stop. So they built what they call crack stoppers into the design. The first 707 was air tested on July 15, 1954. It passed with high praise from the pilots. In 1955, the U.S. Air Force ordered 29 of the planes, but still, there were no orders from the airlines. Finally, a few orders trickled in. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, Douglas Aircraft Company delivered a startling announcement. They would build a similar jet called the DC-8. The crafty Donald Douglas had waited for Boeing to commit to the 707 design. He announced to the airlines that the DC-8 would be larger than the 707, with six abreast seating rather than five. The DC-8 was nicknamed the paper airplane, since it was sold while still on the drawing board. And the interesting thing is that such was the airlines love of Douglas, and such was their confidence in Douglas, they turned around to buy DC-8s before they even got off the drawing board on this. Boeing's Bill Allen had too much invested to let Douglas trump it. While continuing to sell his original 707s, he ordered his engineers to widen the fuselage by 16 inches and install more powerful Pratt & Whitney JT-4 engines. This second version of the 707 was called the Intercontinental, and it truly was. It was the first true long-range commercial jet. The airlines and the flying public loved it. Douglas, the company rushed its paper airplane into production, 
knowing they had to get it right the first time. The grueling production timetable almost wrecked the company. Unfortunately for Douglas, we knew the the management, they were an older company, and they were all in the production difficulties, so the DCA really overstressed them. Once the long-range transcontinental market had been conquered by 707s and DC-8s, the airlines began to ask for short-range jets that could provide economical jet service between major cities in Europe and the U.S. Jets that could service airports with runways too small for the 707s. The next major step, I would say, is that at that time, small jets weren't economical. The, the, the challenge to the industry was to build an airplane, a jet airplane, that was uh, smaller. European plane makers tried to fill this market with several designs that carried less than 100 seats. But it soon became obvious that larger payloads and more power were needed, especially in America. United insisted that the airplane
condition restored, the 727 will go on to become one of the best-selling commercial jets in history. 1,831 sales have been recorded when production ended in 1984. Next, size versus speed, jumbo means economy. Dwight D. Eisenhower became the first American president to travel by jet. He commissioned a 707 to be the first jet-powered Air Force One. Commercial jets will continue on modern marvels. From mid-60s on, the air passenger market continued to splinter and subdivide into smaller and smaller digits. The viability of these operations are calculated by subtracting ticket sales from fuel burn and maintenance costs. At the very heart of this equation is engine power. for speed but fail to turn a real profit. The other would set a new standard for size and bring air travel to the masses. In 1962, sued aviation of France and the British Aircraft Corporation joined forces to produce a commercial aircraft that would travel at over twice the speed of sound, Mach 2.2, roughly 1450 miles per hour. London would suddenly be less than three and a half hours from New York. The radical Delta body craft was named the Concorde. The Concorde's power came from four rear-mounted Olympus engines. Total thrust was over 150,000 pounds, twice the output of a 707. But political bickering and multiple design changes slowed Concorde's inception. It would take eight years before the first prototype would be ready to fly. But the news of the supersonic jet would have an impact across the ocean in the U.S. Pan Am and Boeing would join forces in the first wide-body jumbo jet, the 747. What many people did not know was that right from the start, the 747 was designed as a cargo plane. The wide-body spaciousness was not originally designed for passenger comfort, but rather to ensure that the hull could accommodate 16, two abreast, 8x8 cargo containers. Later models were designed with an upswing nose door to allow straight-in loading. The motivation for all this cargo consciousness was the Concorde. In most aircraft design circles at the time, it was believed that soon all passenger travel would be done in the supersonic jets. They believed that all subsonics, including the 747, would eventually be relegated to freight duty. History would prove them wrong. The problem with supersonic transport is not in the marketing idea. Anybody who's flown across the Pacific Ocean wants to get there a lot faster. Unfortunately, the technology involved is just too expensive and there's not enough market for it. Fearing America would be left behind, the Boeing 
company at the urging of the government began work on their own supersonic transports, even while the 747 was in production. In March of 1969, the first Concorde test flight took place in Toulouse, France. The plane was behind schedule and over budget. The Concorde had hundreds of miles of dollars in the world and there was something that went off. But they could never hear the alarm come out because they knew it early. They knew it more than they could have seen the alarm by stopping the programs. But they couldn't have because of the national program. The airlines began to shy away from the 118 seat payload, fearing ticket sales could never offset operating cost. The designers increased the airframe to hold 136, but still the airlines stayed away in droves. The Europeans tried everything to show off their plan. Well, there's an illustration of that. The same free center and Concord would take off at the same time. The uh, Concord would fly out. Well, we had passengers and fly back and land back at the starting point before the 747 went into the land. These demonstrations hurt rather than help, proving that fuel burn for a transatlantic Concorde flight was 20% greater than that of a 707. Some scientists were also claiming that the high flying plane would damage the ozone. Another major hurdle was noise. People are watching for the supersonically low world and don't want to show the world in the world. The phenomena of sonic wind occurs when an object overtakes and collides with its own sound. This creates a shock wave in the atmosphere similar to a clap of thunder. There has been no solution found or even hinted at for eliminating sonic boom that would allow it to uh, cross population land masses. So we have to fly over the water, it's going to go long distances, and it's going to be very expensive to fly. Boeing's SST made it as far as the mock-up stage before the project was killed. The Concorde was relegated to a high-speed charter service for the wealthy. Though it had been a financial fizzle, it had taught the European plane makers that they must join forces to compete with the Americans. Next, a glimpse into the future of commercial aviation. A commercial jet's cockpit voice recorder, often called the black box, is actually bright orange. Commercial jets will return on modern marvels. After 20-some years of dominating the commercial jet industry, Boeing awoke in the 1970s to find its position being challenged from all sides. The period was called the Wide Body Wars. The Douglas Aircraft in California and the McDonald Aircraft Corporation of St. Louis had merged to become the McDonald Douglas Corporation. This merger had produced the DC-10, a 380-passenger jet. And from across the ocean came the A300 from Airbus Industry. Airbus uh, came into being roughly 30 years ago. Uh, as a result of the various European manufacturers at the time uh, essentially ending up competing with each other and none of them uh, doing a very good job of making any money. They all built fine airplanes, but to go up against the giant American companies at the time, they felt that the only way to be fully competitive was to join forces. As Airbus was gaining ground, McDonnell Douglas was faltering. A series of accidents dogged the DC-10. The flying public lost confidence. The plane was doomed. It would later be redesigned and called the MD-11. By the late 1980s, only Boeing and Airbus were serious contenders. Using the best and the brightest aircraft designers in order and state-of-the-art computer technology, Airbus began to grab larger and larger shares of the world market. Airbus has, uh, over the past 30 years, has developed a product line uh, that covers practically every niche required by uh, today's airlines. From small airplanes, roughly 100 seat, uh, up to four engine airplanes of 400 uh, seats or more. Airbus soon set its sights on Boeing 737 with its A330, a twin jet with a 267 seat payload. It followed with its four engine A340, a 376 seat jetliner, a worthy rival to Boeing 767. Boeing was now in a 
fight to protect its market. The American giant's first response was to stretch the 767 body, but this approach was discarded. In 1990, Boeing took another great risk and chose to design a whole new family. It would be called 777. It would be the most ambitious project since the 747. The technology used would change the way planes are designed and built. The 777 would be the largest twin jet ever built, with a payload of up to 550 seats. The design would take place on a worldwide digital drawing board called CATIA. It would comprise 7,000 workstations in 17 time zones. CATIA allowed us to design on a computer and design through the lines on the computer and assemble the, the entire airplane in terms of its three-dimensional characteristics of all the wires and the tubing and the wireless and the entire airplane on the computer. With the CATIA workstation grid, a worldwide team of designers and fabricators could work on this digital three-dimensional blueprint simultaneously. So for the first time, uh, anywhere, anytime, the entire airplane was totally designed by computer technology. Now this 777 was a 5 billion dollar, 10,000 engineer, 5 year program to do that. In order to accommodate the new production line, Fortress Boeing would have to be expanded. The biggest building in the world was increased by 275,000 cubic yards. The renovation used enough steel to build the Empire State Building twice. To meet the 1994 delivery date, over 240 companies in the U.S. and 11 countries around the world worked simultaneously to produce the 20,000 sub-assemblies required for the 777 project. The 20-foot, 3-inch wide fuselage was built around a skeleton of carbon composite floor beams and aluminum alloy ribs called stringers. The outer skin was made from a new Alcoa aluminum alloy called 2XXX and has the highest fracture toughness of any metal now used in this application. The most critical technology on any twin jet is engine power and reliability. Since the 777 would be flying transoceanic flights, each of its engines had to be able to carry the aircraft by itself should the other engine fail. The engines were the most powerful jet engines ever developed. Pratt & Whitney, Rolls-Royce and General Electric all supplied engines for the 777. Uh, we weigh 60,000 pounds of thrust, and we are going to have service on the 777 with at least 74,000 pounds of thrust, and they will bring that to 9,000 pounds of thrust. The wing spans almost 200 feet in length, in a top surface area of 4,628 square feet.
that's what will happen with the, with the A3X acts. With $10 billion in development, the A3XX will boast a 555-seat capacity with three classes of service. It also may provide passengers with luxuries never before seen on any airliner, such as gyms, theaters, and other frills. Airlines will be able to, at their choice, to put in certain other amenities if they want to put in uh, small lounge areas, if they want to use the lower deck area for uh, blue rooms, uh, for needing for shopping, uh, or for other facilities that they think might be uh, a pain to their passengers. Will A3XX become the design standard for the next 35 years? Only time and technology can tell. One radical alternative for the future is currently being researched at the NASA Space Center in Langley, Virginia. This futuristic super jumbo concept is known as the BWP, or Blend Wing Body. The designers of this delta-shaped flying wing of the future are working on ways to carry 800 passenger payloads across oceans at speeds of 560 miles per hour. Many experts believe that airport design will not be able to keep pace with such quantum leaps in aircraft size and capacity. Commercial aviation has come a long way in a very short time. One of the driving forces in this technological explosion has been an intense competition among a worldwide field of high-stakes players. But ironically, with mergers and takeovers on the rise, the future commercial jet industry may be a world where competition does not exist. Some experts predict because of staggering development costs that the two remaining giants, Boeing and Airbus, will merge into one international plane-making model. But whatever the future holds, we can look back at the past century and know that commercial jets have changed our world. They have carried millions of us to distant lands and helped foster an international exchange of ideas, trade, and culture.